Hey, welcome to Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We're Carly and Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us today. So today we have another uh, legal profession, legal ethics case. Uh, It's the Law Society of Upper Canada, which is obviously now the LSO, and Groya. So I read this case for a legal profession, and I really liked it. It's a super complicated case in the sense that, you know, there was a prospectus from Briex Minerals that contained errors, and then the OSC got involved and prosecuted an individual, and Mr. Groya was the defense attorney for the individual. And it ended up, uh, after the trial had finished, um, the Law Society brought uh, an action against Mr. Groya for his conduct during the trial. So it's sort of, you know, many different aspects of law all coming together in this one case. And it's a split decision. There's a majority and a dissent and a concurring opinion. And they all have very different ideas of who should be the arbiter of lawyers' behavior, and how, and when, and when it's okay, and when it's not, and it's really neat stuff. Yeah, I, you had said you had read this in Legal Ethics, and we were talking before we started recording really briefly, and I was like, I have never heard yeah. of this case. No. I a definitely blast. need to know it, right? Like, yeah. It's really interesting. Stuff. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, it's super interesting. Like, it's just, you know, it's the idea that, like, because essentially the majority comes down on the side that, you know, if a lawyer is making, a lawyer needs to be a zealous advocate, right? And we all agree. And so if a lawyer is making sort of claims against the other side and they're in good faith, it is okay if they have a reasonable basis for these claims, but that they're wrong, right? That, the, you know, they, they've just made a mistake of law. They don't understand the law, but they think that they do and they think that it's reasonable. And so they make these claims. That's all right. Whereas, you know, the dissent's like, that is not all right, because it's going to shield, you know, bad conduct under the defense of, well, I didn't know the law, so it was fine. And then, you know, you have a concurring decision that's just like changing everything and is like, nope, the judge is the arbiter of behavior and this is a correcting standard. And yeah, this decision is super fascinating. It is all over the place. Many, many different opinions. And yeah, what I think is interesting about cases in particular like this one where you have such a wild variance between um, majority dissent and concurring decisions is you can see the elements that you agree with likely in all three, but you can also see the parts in all three that you vehemently disagree with. And it reminds me of my admin class and we were discussing, you know, like the role of the Supreme Court and judges generally and how, as students, at least, when we engage with the material, it's okay to engage with it critically and to be, you know, even though I agree mostly with the majority, there are aspects of it I'm like, you know, I don't necessarily agree with this point in law. Like, you're allowed to do that as a student in class. And if any students are listening, don't be afraid to sometimes (laughs) challenge the decisions of the Supreme Court. It's okay. Like, that's what you do in law. Oh, yeah, definitely. And yeah, and I mean, and you can even see the court struggling with it internally, right? Because, you know, the dissent saying this might open up due to a door that we might not be able to close and all this stuff. And then the majority saying, well, maybe, but there are other ways that law societies can regulate lawyers under like different heads. Right. So, you know, Mr. Groya is being disciplined for civility issues, but other issues exist. So, you know, the dissent is saying, well, you know, having a mistake of law defense is inappropriate because lawyers should, should know the law. And the majority is like. You know, we agree, but we don't agree because in this instance, sure, but lawyers do have to know the law under other provisions. They have to know the law under competence, for example. So, you know, there are multi-factor things at play and each province will have their own code that lawyers will fall under. And it's just very, very interesting. And even, you know, Groy is also kind of an admin law decision in the sense that there is a concurring opinion that's saying, like, the standard is wrong. We shouldn't be doing law society disciplinary stuff that takes place in a court on a reasonableness standard. That's wrong. It should be correctness. Obviously, um, this is a pre Vavilov. So who knows, uh, what that's going to do now? Probably nothing, but any sort of correctness pre that decision is fuzzy now because uh, the test changed slightly. So, which is, you know, super fun for taking admin approximately two weeks before that decision came out. Fun times. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, that was that's always an interesting one, and especially with a decision like this in a post Vavilov world, I wonder. I mean, the door has been left open to re-examine this when you have three different yeah. opinions in a case. And so I wonder if we're going to see this issue like re-litigated in the future, right? Because we have a new standard of review. And in this, you know, digital age, like what about like lawyers on Twitter and professionalism yep. there, right? Yep. It's, it's not always just letters in the courtroom. Like what about social media? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, no. We've got Definitely. a lot of opportunity to revisit like, know, lawyer conduct. Literally. Yeah, well, I know. Lawyers on Twitter beware, I guess. <laughs> All right, guys, enjoy this one. Groya and Law Society of Upper Canada. Groya and the Law Society of Upper Canada. Judgment of the Majority by Justice Moldaver. Part 1. Overview. The trial process in Canada is one of the cornerstones of our constitutional democracy. It is essential to the maintenance of a civilized society. Trials are the primary mechanism whereby disputes are resolved in a just, peaceful, and orderly way. To achieve their purpose, it is essential that trials be conducted in a civilized manner. Trials marked by strife belligerent behavior, unwarranted personal attacks, and other forms of disruptive and discourteous conduct are antithetical to the peaceful and orderly resolution of disputes we strive to achieve. By the same token, trials are not, nor are they meant to be, tea parties. A lawyer's duty to act with civility does not exist in a vacuum. Rather, it exists in concert with a series of professional obligations that both constrain and compel a lawyer's behavior. Care must be taken to ensure that free expression, resolute advocacy, and the right of an accused to make full answer and defense are not sacrificed at the altar of civility. The proceedings against the appellant, Joseph Groya, highlight the delicate interplay that these considerations give rise to. At issue is whether Mr. Groya's courtroom conduct in the case of the Queen and Feldehoff warranted a finding of professional misconduct by the Law Society of Upper Canada. To be precise, was the Law Society appeal panel's finding of professional misconduct against Mr. Groya reasonable in the circumstances? For the reasons that follow, I am respectfully of the view that it was not. The appeal panel developed an approach for assessing whether a lawyer's uncivil behavior crosses the line into professional misconduct. The approach, with which I take no issue, targets the type of conduct that can compromise trial fairness and diminish public confidence in the administration of justice. It allows for a proportionate balancing of the law society's mandate to set and enforce standards of civility in the legal profession with a lawyer's right to free speech. It is also sensitive to the lawyer's duty of resolute advocacy and the client's constitutional right to make full answer and defense. Moreover, the appeal panel's approach is flexible enough to capture the broad array of situations in which lawyers may slip into uncivil behavior, yet precise enough to guide lawyers and law societies on the scope of permissible conduct. That said, the appeal panel's finding of professional misconduct against Mr. Groya on the basis of incivility was, in my respectful view, unreasonable. Even though the appeal panel accepted that Mr. Groya's allegations of prosecutorial misconduct were made in good faith, it used his honest but erroneous views as to the disclosure and admissibility of documents to conclude that his allegations lacked a reasonable basis. However, as I will explain, Mr. Groya's allegations were made in good faith and they were reasonably based. As such, the allegations themselves could not reasonably support a finding of professional misconduct. Nor could the other contextual factors in this case reasonably support a finding of professional misconduct against Mr. Groya on the basis of incivility. The evolving abuse of process law at the time accounts, at least in part, 
for the frequency of Mr. Groya's allegations. The presiding judge took a passive approach in the face of Mr. Groya's allegations. And when the presiding judge and reviewing courts did direct Mr. Groya, apart from a few slips, he listened. The appeal panel failed to account for these contextual factors in its analysis. In my view, the only conclusion that was reasonably open to the appeal panel on the record before it was a finding that Mr. Groya was not guilty of professional misconduct. Accordingly, I would allow Mr. Groya's appeal. Part 2. Factual Background Mr. Groya's alleged misconduct stems from his in-court behavior while representing John Feldehoff. Mr. Feldehoff was an officer and director of Brie X Minerals Limited, a Canadian mining company. Brie X collapsed when claims that it had discovered a gold mine proved false. The fraud, one of the largest in Canadian capital markets, cost investors over $6 billion. The Ontario Securities Commission, OSC, charged Mr. Feldehoff with insider trading and authorizing misleading news releases under the Securities Act. Mr. Feldehoff hired Mr. Groya, a former OSC prosecutor, to defend him. The trial proceeded in the Ontario Court of Justice before Justice Peter Hrin. It took place in two phases. Phase 1 began on October 16, 2000 and lasted 70 days. Phase 2 did not begin until March 2004. On July 31, 2007, Mr. Feldehoff was acquitted of all charges. Phase 1 of the Feldehoff trial was characterized by a pattern of escalating acrimony between Mr. Groya and the OSC prosecutors. A series of disputes plagued the proceedings with a toxicity that manifested itself in the form of personal attacks, sarcastic outbursts, and allegations of professional impropriety, grinding the trial to a near standstill. Subpart A, Disclosure Disputes. Disputes between Mr. Groya and the OSC prosecutors arose during the disclosure process. The Brie X investigation yielded an extensive documentary record. The OSC initially disclosed interview transcripts and so-called C-binders, binders of documents the OSC intended to use as part of its case against Mr. Feldehoff. It did not, however, disclose a substantial body of additional documents it had in its possession. The OSC prosecutors and Mr. Groya disagreed over the scope and format of further disclosure sought by the defense. According to Mr. Groya, it was the OSC's responsibility to sort through all of the documents it had in its possession and to disclose hard copies of any relevant document to the defense. When the OSC prosecutors refused to do so, Mr. Groya wrote a letter to the OSC alleging that the prosecution was, quote, operating under a serious misapprehension of its disclosure obligations, end quote, an error that Mr. Groya described as, quote, an abuse of process, end quote. He would build on these themes as the trial progressed. In response, the OSC offered to disclose electronic copies of the documents in its possession and provide Mr. Groya, quote, with a reasonable supply of blank paper, end quote. Dissatisfied with the OSC's response, Mr. Groya moved for additional disclosure. Mr. Naster, the lead OSC prosecutor, argued that the OSC was not aware of any relevant document that had not been disclosed to Mr. Felderhoff. The trial judge, however, agreed with Mr. Groya and ordered the OSC to disclose a further 235 boxes of documents and hard copies of documents stored on 15 disks in its possession. Subpart B, the second disclosure motion. As the trial neared, the parties were still at odds over disclosure. Adamant that the OSC had not fulfilled its disclosure obligations, Mr. Groya sent Mr. Nasser a letter accusing the OSC of adopting a, quote, win-at-all-costs mentality, which demonstrated a shocking disregard for Mr. Feldehoff's rights, end quote. 
Mr. Groya then brought a motion arguing that the OSC's disclosure was so deficient that it amounted to an abusive process warranting a stay of proceedings. In the alternative, Mr. Groya sought full disclosure and in the further alternative, an order prohibiting the OSC from calling witnesses until it had made full disclosure. Interspersed throughout Mr. Groya's submissions on the motion were allegations that the prosecutors were, quote, unable or unwilling to recognize their responsibilities, motivated by an animus towards the defense, and determined to make Mr. Feldhoff's ability to defend himself as difficult as possible, end quote. By the end of the motion, Mr. Groya conceded that the stringent test for a stay of proceedings had not been met. Accordingly, the trial judge declined to stay the prosecution. Once again, however, he was satisfied that the OSC had not fulfilled its disclosure obligations and he ordered additional disclosure. The trial judge also admonished the OSC for a comment made by one of its media personnel that the OSC's goal, quote, was simply to seek a conviction on the charges it had laid, end quote. Subpart C, the admissibility of documents. Characteristic of most Securities Act prosecutions, the case against Mr. Feldehoff relied heavily on documentary evidence. Between them, the prosecution and the defense had nearly a hundred binders containing thousands of documents. Disputes over the admissibility of those documents was a major source of friction throughout the trial. Mr. Nastor initially suggested that either party could provisionally tender documents subject to arrangements as to their admissibility at the end of the trial. Mr. Groya rejected this approach. He was concerned that given the staggering size of the fraud, a number of BREEX documents were falsified. As such, he insisted that the admissibility of each document should be ruled on as the document was tendered. Mr. Nastor then changed his position seeking an omnibus ruling on the admissibility of all of the documents. The trial judge declined to hear Mr. Nastor's motion, and the parties were put to the strict proof of each document they proposed to tender. The disputes resulted in frequent objections and lengthy arguments on the admissibility and use of individual documents. The first OSC witness had to be excused for large periods of time as the parties argued. The disputes became increasingly hostile and ground the trial to a near standstill. After 42 days of evidence, the first OSC witness's testimony had yet to be completed. Much of the disagreement stemmed from Mr. Groya's honest but mistaken understanding of the law of evidence and the role of the prosecutor. His position on the admissibility of documents was founded on two legal errors. First, Mr. Groya maintained that the prosecution was duty-bound to introduce all authentic, relevant documents and that its failure to introduce relevant exculpatory documents through its own witnesses was a deliberate tactic. First, Mr. Groya maintained that the prosecution was duty-bound to introduce all authentic, relevant documents and that its failure to introduce relevant exculpatory documents through its own witnesses was a deliberate tactic designed to ensure that Mr. Feldehoff did not receive a fair trial. Second, Mr. Groya believed that he could put documents acknowledged by the OSC as being authentic to the first OSC witness even though the witness had not authored them and couldn't identify them. Mr. Nasser's objections to this approach spawned further allegations of prosecutorial impropriety. Mr. Groya argued that the OSC was using, quote, a conviction filter, end quote, and thwarting Mr. Groya's attempts to secure a fair trial for his client. Mr. Groya's mistaken position on the admissibility of documents was reinforced by Mr. Nasser's comments in the first disclosure motion that he had, quote, an obligation as a prosecutor to ensure that all relevant materials are placed before the trial judge, end quote. In addition, Mr. Groya mistook Mr. Nasser's concession that he was duty-bound to disclose all relevant documents as a promise that he would consent to the admissibility of those documents at trial. In Mr. Groya's view, 
Mr. Nasser unfairly reneged on his promise. The OSC was not entirely blameless for these skirmishes. Mr. Nasser continued to challenge the trial judge's ruling declining to hear an omnibus document motion, lamenting that he was getting, quote, shafted big time, end quote. Both sides stubbornly dug their heels in, refusing to budge and taking every opportunity to quarrel. Despite the frequency and fervor of the disputes, the trial judge initially adopted a hands-off approach, opting to stay above the fray. Mr. Nastor repeatedly invited the judge to rule on Mr. Groya's allegations of prosecutorial misconduct and to stay the proceedings as an abusive process if he found the allegations to be substantiated. For his part, Mr. Groya made it clear that while he did not intend to bring an abusive process motion at the time, he was putting the prosecutors on notice that their conduct was unacceptable and laying the groundwork for an abusive process motion later in the proceedings. Accordingly, the trial judge postponed any ruling on the propriety of the prosecution's conduct. It was not until the 57th day of trial that the judge directed Mr. Groya to stop repeating his misconduct allegations. Instead, whenever Mr. Groya felt the prosecution was acting inappropriately, he was simply to state that he was making, quote, the same objection, end quote. The trial judge reiterated his instruction a few days later. Mr. Groya largely followed the trial judge's directions for the remainder of phase one. Subpart D, the judicial review application. During a scheduled three-week hiatus in the Felderhof trial, the OSC brought a judicial review application in the Superior Court before Justice Campbell, seeking the removal of the trial judge. The OSC argued that the trial judge had committed a number of errors which caused him to lose jurisdiction and undermined the OSC's right to a fair trial. One of the OSC's grounds for its application was the trial judge's failure to rein in Mr. Groya's uncivil behavior thereby creating a reasonable apprehension of bias. Justice Campbell dismissed the application. He found no jurisdictional error necessitating the trial judge's removal. He concluded that the trial judge had acted in an even-handed manner throughout phase one. Justice Campbell also noted that Mr. Groya's stance on the role of the prosecutor was mistaken explaining at paragraph 33 that the prosecution was entitled to seek a conviction, quote, within the appropriate limits of fairness, end quote. Despite Mr. Feldehoff's success on the judicial review application, Justice Campbell declined to order costs against the OSC, in part because of Mr. Groya's, quote, appallingly unrestrained conduct, end quote. The Court of Appeal for Ontario dismissed the OSC's appeal from Justice Campbell's order. Writing for a unanimous panel, Appeal Justice Rosenberg clarified that although the defense has the right to allege abuse of process, that allegation should only be made at the appropriate juncture and with a sufficient factual foundation. And even then, quote, Defense counsel was obliged to make submissions without the rhetorical excess and invective that Mr. Groya sometimes employed. End quote. Justice Campbell and Appeal Justice Rosenberg were each critical of Mr. Groya's behavior throughout the trial. Justice Campbell observed that, quote, Mr. Groya took every opportunity to needle Mr. Nasser with sarcastic allegations of professional misconduct. End quote and described Mr. Groya's submissions as, quote, descending from legal argument to irony and sarcasm to petulant invective, end quote. Appeal Justice Rosenberg similarly noted that, quote, Mr. Groya was prone to rhetorical excess and sarcasm and described his submissions as unseemly, unhelpful, and improper, end quote. Both judges also voiced displeasure with how the prosecution had behaved, noting that there had been, quote, tactical maneuvering on both sides, and that neither side had any monopoly over incivility or rhetorical excess, end quote. The Feldehoff trial resumed in March 2004, with new counsel appearing for the OSC. In line with the guidance provided by Justice Campbell and Appeal Justice Rosenberg, 
the evidentiary disputes were resolved and the second phase of the trial proceeded without further incident, completing on July 31, 2007, with Mr. Feldhoff being acquitted on all charges. Part 3. Procedural History Subpart A. The Law Society Disciplinary Proceedings In 2004, the Law Society launched an investigation into Mr. Groya's conduct during the Felderhoff trial. The Law Society initiated the investigation on its own motion. No independent complaint was filed against Mr. Groya. At Mr. Groya's request, the Law Society postponed its investigation until the Feldhoff trial ended. On November 18, 2009, more than nine years after the Felderhoff trial began, the Law Society brought disciplinary proceedings against Mr. Groya, alleging professional misconduct based on his uncivil behavior during Phase 1 of the trial. The professional misconduct allegations were first litigated before a three-member panel of the Law Society. Mr. Groya testified in his own defense. The hearing panel concluded that allowing Mr. Groya to relitigate the propriety of his conduct was an abuse of process, given Justice Campbell and Appeal Justice Rosenberg's findings on the issue. This despite the fact that Mr. Groya was not a party to the judicial review proceedings and made no submissions on his own behalf in defense of his behavior. Relying heavily on those findings, the hearing panel found Mr. Groya guilty of professional misconduct. It suspended Mr. Groya's license to practice law for two months and ordered him to pay nearly $247,000 in costs. Mr. Groya appealed the hearing panel's decision to the Law Society Appeal Panel. The appeal panel found that the hearing panel had erred in treating the Felderhoff judicial review findings as conclusive and precluding Mr. Groya from defending his behavior. At the request of both parties, the appeal panel considered the professional misconduct allegations against Mr. Groya de novo based on the record of proceedings before the hearing panel, including Mr. Groya's testimony before that body. The appeal panel grappled with the issue of when in-court incivility amounts to professional misconduct under the Law Society's Code of Conduct in force at the relevant time. It reasoned that incivility, quote, captures a range of unprofessional communications, end quote, and ultimately settled on a multifactorial, contextual-specific approach for assessing a lawyer's behavior. In particular, the appeal panel articulated a series of contextual factors, what the lawyer said, the manner and frequency in which it was said, and the presiding judge's reaction to the lawyer's behavior that should generally be taken into account. In the final analysis, the appeal panel concluded that Mr. Groy was guilty of professional misconduct. As indicated, it based its findings entirely on the record before the hearing panel. Because the appeal panel did not hear Mr. Groya testify, it was not in a position to assess his credibility. It therefore assumed that Mr. Groya had made his allegations of professional impropriety against the OSC prosecutors in good faith based on his testimony before the hearing panel. Nevertheless, it concluded that Mr. Groya's repeated personal attacks lacked a reasonable basis. While the appeal panel acknowledged that the prosecutors were not entirely blameless, it could find nothing in the way the OSC conducted the trial that suggested it adopted a win-at-all-costs approach or intentionally sabotaged Mr. Groya's attempts to secure a fair trial for his client. The appeal panel reduced Mr. Groya's suspension to one month and decreased the cost award against him to $200,000. Subpart B, the Ontario Superior Court of Justice, Divisional Court. Mr. Groya appealed to the Divisional Court from the appeal panel's decision. The Divisional Court reasoned that the appeal panel's approach did not sufficiently protect resolute advocacy. In its view, for a lawyer to be found guilty of professional misconduct, it was necessary that the lawyer's behavior bring, or have a tendency to bring, the administration of justice into disrepute. Nevertheless, 
the divisional court upheld the appeal panel's decision as reasonable. It found that the appeal panel considered all of the relevant factors and, quote, expressed in a fair, rational, and understandable way why it ultimately concluded that the appellant's conduct amounted to professional misconduct, end quote. Subpart C, the Court of Appeal for Ontario. A majority of the Court of Appeal dismissed Mr. Groya's further appeal. Appeal Justice Cronk, writing for the majority, identified reasonableness as the appropriate standard for review. In her view, nothing displaced the presumption of reasonableness that applied to the appeal panel's interpretation of its enabling legislation. Justice Cronk found the appeal panel's decision reasonable. It did not unduly impinge on a lawyer's duty to resolutely advocate on his or her client's behalf. It proportionately balanced the lawyer's and client's expressive freedoms, and it was not vague or ill-defined. According to Appeal Justice Cronk, the appeal panel's finding of professional misconduct was amply justified. In her view, Mr. Groy's conduct, quote, exceeded even the most broadly defined reasonable boundaries of zealous advocacy, affected the orderly progression of the trial, and contributed to the delay in the completion of the testimony of the first witness. Justice Brown, dissenting, disagreed with the majority's position on both the standard of review and the application of the standard to the appeal panel's decision. In his view, the fact that Mr. Groya's conduct took place in a court fundamentally altered the analysis. The primacy of the judiciary as arbiters of in-court conduct mandated correctness review to ensure that, quote, courts remain the final umpires of the propriety of what barristers do in courtrooms, end quote. In Justice Brown's view, the appeal panel's approach to determining whether a lawyer's behavior warrants professional sanction underemphasized the effect of the lawyer's conduct on the fairness of the proceeding. Furthermore, it failed to give, quote, meaningful consideration to the rulings made by the trial judge and the response of the barrister to those rulings, end quote. Appeal Justice Brown proposed a test that assessed the lawyer's conduct, its effect on the proceeding, and the presiding judge's response. Applying that test, he would not have found Mr. Groya guilty of professional misconduct. Although Mr. Groya's personal attacks on the OSC prosecutors were improper, they did not undermine trial fairness. Mr. Groya largely complied with the trial judge's instructions to refrain from making invective-laced allegations. And after the Court of Appeal for Ontario administered a, quote, public shaming, end quote, phase two of the trial proceeded without incident. Part four, analysis. Subpart A, the standard of review. This court's decision in Law Society of New Brunswick and Ryan and Doré and Barreau du Québec established that Law Society misconduct findings and sanctions are reviewed for reasonableness. That is the standard against which the appeal panel's decision is to be assessed. In the ordinary course, an established standard of review obviates the need for a full standard of review analysis. However, Given the lower court's conspicuous disagreement on the standard of review, in my view it is helpful to explain why a reasonableness standard applies. Setting threshold criteria for a finding of professional misconduct and assessing whether a lawyer's behavior satisfies those criteria involve the interpretation of the Law Society's home statute and the exercise of discretion under it and are thus presumptively entitled to deference. As I will explain, that presumption is not rebutted. This court's post-Dunsmuir jurisprudence has firmly entrenched the notion that decisions of specialized administrative bodies, quote, interpreting their own statute or statutes closely connected to their function, end quote, are entitled to deference from courts and are thus presumptively reviewed for reasonableness. That presumption applies here. The appeal panel's approach to determining when incivility amounts to professional misconduct and its application of that approach in assessing Mr. Groya's conduct involve an interpretation of the rules of professional conduct enacted under its home statute. 
and the discretionary application of general principles to the facts before it. The appeal panel's decision is thus presumptively reviewed for reasonableness. Mr. Groya, along with Appeal Justice Brown in dissent, share the view that the presumption of reasonableness is rebutted in this case, albeit for different reasons. Mr. Groya argues that determining when incivility amounts to professional misconduct is a question of central importance outside the law society's expertise. He also adopts Appeal Justice Brown's position that a crucial distinction exists between in-court and out-of-court conduct, necessitating correctness review. With respect, I cannot accept these arguments. 1. Question of central importance outside the law society's expertise. Dunsmuir identifies four narrow categories for which correctness review is appropriate. Only one is at issue here. Questions of central importance to the legal system as a whole and outside the decision maker's expertise. Mr. Groya argues that determining when in-court behavior amounts to professional misconduct falls under this category. Unquestionably, lawyers are vital to the proper functioning of the administration of justice in our free and democratic society. As Justice Major observed in the Queen and McClure, quote, the law is a complex web of interests, relationships, and rules. The integrity of the administration of justice depends upon the unique role of the solicitor who provides legal advice to clients within this complex system, end quote. By guiding clients through this complex web of interests, lawyers uphold the rule of law. They provide those subject to our legal system a means to self-determination under and through the law and guard against arbitrary or unjustified state action. As such, the permissible scope of their in-court behavior is arguably of central importance to the legal system as a whole. But even assuming that this raises a question of central importance, it cannot be said that assessing whether incivility amounts to professional misconduct is outside the law society's expertise. To the contrary, law society disciplinary tribunals have significant expertise regulating the legal profession. One of the law society's core functions, quote, is to establish general rules applicable to all members to ensure ethical conduct, protect the public, and discipline lawyers who breach the rules, end quote. And the Law Society has over two centuries of institutional expertise fulfilling this mandate. Moreover, Law Society disciplinary panels are composed, in part, of other lawyers. As Justice Corey remarked in Re Stevens and Law Society of Upper Canada, quote, Probably no one could approach a complaint against a lawyer with more understanding than a group composed primarily of members of his profession, end quote. This understanding comes from experience. Lawyers are, quote, keenly aware of the problems and frustrations that confront a practitioner, end quote. Two, in court versus out of court conduct. Even where the question under review does not fit neatly into one of the four Dunsmuir correctness categories, a contextual analysis that reveals a legislative intent not to defer to a tribunal's decision may nonetheless rebut the presumption of reasonableness. Appeal Justice Brown and Mr. Groya refer to one particular contextual factor. Mr. Groya's uncivil behavior took place in a courtroom. In their view, reviewing professional misconduct findings based on in-court behavior for reasonableness impermissibly infringes on judicial independence. They maintain that in assessing whether courtroom conduct crosses the line, correctness review is required to ensure, quote, the court has the last word in answering the question, end quote. With respect, the fact that Mr. Groya's uncivil behavior took place in a courtroom is, in my view, irrelevant to determining the standard of review. To be sure, the independence of the judiciary is a constitutional cornerstone. Crucial to the principle of judicial independence is the presiding judge's power to control his or her courtroom. However, I do not see a deferential standard of review as threatening that power. 
In this regard, I agree with Appeal Justice Cronk that, quote, the application of the reasonableness standard of review in cases like this one in no way intrudes on a presiding judge's authority to control the process in his or her own courtroom, end quote. Courts and law societies enjoy concurrent jurisdiction to regulate and enforce standards of courtroom behavior. A trial judge is free to control the conduct in his or her courtroom irrespective of the degree of deference accorded to a law society's disciplinary decision by a different court. To be clear, the location of the impugned behavior is unquestionably relevant to the misconduct analysis itself. As I will explain, the fact that the behavior occurs in a courtroom is an important contextual factor that must be taken into account when evaluating whether that behavior amounted to professional misconduct, but it does not impact on the standard of review. In sum, the appeal panel's decision is reviewed for reasonableness. Subpart B, was the appeal panel's decision reasonable? A, the appeal panel's approach. To determine whether the appeal panel's decision was reasonable, i.e. whether it fell within a range of reasonable outcomes, it is necessary to explore how the appeal panel reached its result. In that case, as is apparent from its reasons, the appeal panel first developed an approach for assessing whether a lawyer's behavior crosses the line into professional misconduct on the basis of incivility. Having done so, it then evaluated whether Mr. Groy was guilty of professional misconduct. The appeal panel took a context-specific approach to evaluating a lawyer's in-court behavior. In particular, it considered whether Mr. Groy's allegations were made in good faith and had a reasonable basis. It also identified the frequency and manner in which Mr. Groya made his submissions and the trial judge's reaction to Mr. Groya's behavior as relevant considerations. Mr. Groya maintains that the appeal panel's approach led to an unreasonable result. Several interveners join him, pointing to perceived weaknesses in different aspects of the appeal panel's approach and urging this court to adopt their preferred approaches for evaluating a lawyer's conduct. These arguments can be broadly grouped into four categories. First, the appeal panel's approach does not appropriately balance civility and resolute advocacy. Second, it does not provide enough guidance to lawyers. Third, it does not properly account for the presiding judge's reaction to the lawyer's behavior and judicial independence. Fourth, it disproportionately balances the law society's statutory mandate with the lawyer's right to free expression. For the reasons that follow, I would reject these submissions. When developing an approach for assessing whether incivility amounts to professional misconduct, the appeal panel recognized the importance of civility while remaining sensitive to the lawyer's duty of resolute advocacy a duty of particular importance in the criminal context because of the client's constitutional right to make full answer and defense. Its context-specific approach is flexible enough to assess allegedly uncivil behavior arising out of the diverse array of situations in which courtroom lawyers find themselves. At the same time, the appeal panel set a reasonably precise benchmark that instructs lawyers as to permissible bounds of ethical courtroom behavior, articulating a series of factors that ought generally to be considered when evaluating a lawyer's conduct and describing how those factors operate when assessing a lawyer's behavior. Finally, the appeal panel's approach allows law society disciplinary tribunals to proportionately balance the lawyer's expressive freedom with its statutory mandate in any given case. A the appeal panel recognized the importance of civility. To begin, when developing its approach, the appeal panel recognized the importance of civility to the legal profession and the corresponding need to target behavior that detrimentally affects the administration of justice and the fairness of a particular proceeding. The duty to practice with civility has long been embodied in the legal profession's collective conscious, and for good reason. Civility has been described as, quote, the glue that holds the adversary system together that keeps it from imploding, end quote. Practicing law with civility brings with it a host of benefits, both personal and to the profession as a whole. 
Conversely, incivility is damaging to trial fairness and the administration of justice in a number of ways. First, incivility can prejudice a client's cause. Overly aggressive, sarcastic, or demanding courtroom language may lead triers of fact, be they judge or jury, to view the lawyer, and therefore the client's case, unfavorably. Uncivil communications with opposing counsel can cause a breakdown in the relationship, eliminating any prospect of settlement and increasing the client's legal costs by forcing unnecessary court proceedings to adjudicate disputes that could have been resolved with a simple phone call. As one American commentator aptly wrote, quote, conduct that may be characterized as uncivil, abrasive, hostile, or obstructive necessarily impedes the goal of resolving conflicts rationally, peacefully, and efficiently, in turn delaying or even denying justice. This mindset eliminates peaceable dealings and often forces dilatory, inconsiderate tactics that detract from just resolution, end quote. Second, incivility is distracting. A lawyer forced to defend against constant allegations of impropriety will naturally be less focused on arguing the case. Uncivil behavior also distracts the triers of fact by diverting their attention away from the substantive merits of the case. The trial judge risks becoming preoccupied with policing counsel's conduct instead of focusing on the evidence and legal issues. Third, incivility adversely impacts other justice system participants. Disparaging personal attacks from lawyers, whether or not they are directed at a witness, can exacerbate the already stressful task of testifying at trial. Finally, incivility can erode public confidence in the administration of justice, a vital component of an effective justice system. Inappropriate vitriol, sarcasm, and baseless allegations of impropriety in a courtroom can cause the parties and the public at large to question the reliability of result. Incivility thus diminishes the public's perception of the justice system as a fair dispute resolution and truth-seeking mechanism. The appeal panel was alive to the profound importance of civility in the legal profession when developing its approach. It recognized that civility protects and enhances the administration of justice, targeting behavior that could call into question trial fairness and the public's perception of the administration of justice. Mr. Groya and various interveners argue that the appeal panel should have gone further. Like the divisional court, they would require that before a lawyer can be found guilty of professional misconduct, the lawyer's behavior must bring the administration of justice into disrepute or impact trial fairness. With respect, I would not give effect to these arguments. I echo the comments of Appeal Justice Cronk that such a requirement is, quote, unnecessary and unduly restrictive, end quote. The appeal panel's approach targets conduct that tends to compromise trial fairness and bring the administration of justice into disrepute making an explicit requirement unnecessary. Moreover, uncivil behavior worthy of sanction may not have a perceptible impact on the fairness of the particular proceeding. Finally, in my view, requiring the law society to evaluate the fairness of a proceeding would shift the focus away from the lawyer's behavior and inappropriately imbue the law society with a judicial function. The appeal panel accounted for the relationship between civility and resolute advocacy. Second, in developing its approach, the appeal panel was sensitive to the lawyer's duty of resolute advocacy and the client's constitutional right to make full answer in defense. It held that, quote, the word civility should not be used to discourage fearless advocacy, end quote and was careful to create an approach which ensured, quote, that the vicissitudes that confront courtroom advocates are fairly accounted for so as not to create a chilling effect on zealous advocacy, end quote. Although of doubtless importance, the duty to practice with civility is not a lawyer's sole ethical mandate. Rather, it exists in concert with a series of professional obligations that both constrain and compel a lawyer's behavior. The duty of civility must be understood in light of these other obligations. 
In particular, standards of civility cannot compromise the lawyer's duty of resolute advocacy. The importance of resolute advocacy cannot be overstated. It is a vital ingredient in our adversarial justice system, a system premised on the idea that forceful partisan advocacy facilitates truth-seeking. Moreover, resolute advocacy is a key component of the lawyer's commitment to the client's cause, a principle on fundamental justice under Section 7 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Resolute advocacy requires lawyers to, quote, raise fearlessly every issue, advance every argument, and ask every question, however distasteful, that the lawyer thinks will help the client's cause, end quote. This is no small order. Lawyers are regularly called on to make submissions on behalf of their clients that are unpopular and at times uncomfortable. These submissions can be met with harsh criticism from the public, the bar, and even the court. Lawyers must stand resolute in the face of this adversity by continuing to advocate on their client's behalf despite popular opinion to the contrary. The duty of resolute advocacy takes on particular salience in the criminal law context. Criminal defense lawyers are the final frontier between the accused and the power of the state. As Justice Corey noted in the inquiry regarding Thomas Sofano, quote, it cannot be forgotten that it is often only the defense counsel who stand between the lynch mob and the accused. Defense counsel must be courageous, not only in the face of an outraged and inflamed community, but also on occasion the apparent disapproval of the court, end quote. For criminal defense lawyers, fearless advocacy extends beyond ethical obligations into the realm of constitutional imperatives. As the intervener, the Criminal Lawyers Association of Ontario notes, defense lawyers advancing the accused right to make full answer and defense, quote, are frequently required to criticize the way state actors do their jobs, end quote. These criticisms range from routine charter applications, alleging, for example, an unconstitutional search, detention, or arrest, to serious allegations of professional misconduct. Defense lawyers must have sufficient latitude to advance their client's right to make full answer and defense by raising arguments about the propriety of state actors' conduct without fear of reprisal. In saying this, I should not be taken as endorsing incivility in the name of resolute advocacy. In this regard, I agree with both Appeal Justice Kronk and Appeal Justice Rosenberg that civility and resolute advocacy are not incompatible. To the contrary, civility is often the most effective form of advocacy. Nevertheless, when defining incivility and assessing whether a lawyer's behavior crosses the line, Care must be taken to set a sufficiently high threshold that will not chill the kind of fearless advocacy that is at times necessary to advance the client's cause. The appeal panel recognized the need to develop an approach that would avoid such a chilling effect. The appeal panel developed an approach that is both flexible and precise. A rigid definition of when incivility amounts to professional misconduct in the courtroom is neither attainable nor desirable. Rather, determining whether a lawyer's behavior warrants a finding of professional misconduct must remain a context-specific inquiry that is flexible enough to assess behavior arising from the diverse array of situations in which lawyers find themselves. And yet standards of civility must be articulated with reasonable degrees of precision. An overly vague or open-ended test for incivility risks eroding resolute advocacy. Prudent lawyers will steer clear of a blurry boundary to avoid a potential misconduct finding for advancing arguments that may rightly be critical of other justice system participants. In contrast, a standard that is reasonably ascertainable gives lawyers a workable definition which they can use to guide their behavior. It also guides law society disciplinary tribunals in their task of determining whether a lawyer's behavior amounts to professional misconduct. The appeal panel's approach strikes a reasonable balance between flexibility and precision. The appeal panel describes its approach to assessing whether a lawyer's uncivil behavior warrants professional sanction as, quote, 
fundamentally contextual and fact-specific, noting the importance of considering the dynamics, complexity, and particular burdens and stakes of the trial or other proceeding." End quote. By focusing on the particular factual matrix before it, the appeal panel's approach is flexible enough to accommodate the diverse array of situations in which courtroom lawyers find themselves. At the same time, the appeal panel's approach is sufficiently precise to delineate an appropriate boundary past which behavior warrants a professional misconduct finding. The appeal panel identified a set of factors that a disciplinary panel ought generally to consider when evaluating a lawyer's conduct. It then provided guidance on how those factors operate when assessing a lawyer's behavior. Importantly, as the appeal panel recognized, this list is not closed and the weight assigned to each factor will vary case by case. I turn to those factors now. Factors to consider when assessing a lawyer's behavior. 1. What the lawyer said. First, the appeal panel looked to what the lawyer said. Mr. Groya alleged prosecutorial misconduct throughout phase one of the Felderhoff trial. As such, the appeal panel had to determine when these kinds of allegations amount to professional misconduct. It concluded that prosecutorial misconduct allegations or other challenges to opposing counsel's integrity cross the line into professional misconduct unless they are made in good faith and have a reasonable basis. In other words, allegations that are either made in bad faith or without a reasonable basis amount to professional misconduct. Two points about evaluating what the lawyer said warrant comment. First, I do not read the appeal panel's reasons as characterizing allegations made in bad faith or without a reasonable basis as a standalone test for professional misconduct. When the reasons are read as a whole, it is apparent that whether or not allegations of prosecutorial misconduct are made in bad faith or without a reasonable basis is simply one piece of the fundamentally contextual and fact-specific analysis for determining whether a lawyer's behavior amounts to professional misconduct. To be clear, in some circumstances, bad faith allegations or allegations that lack a reasonable basis may, on their own, warrant a finding of professional misconduct. However, a law society disciplinary tribunal must always take into account the full panoply of contextual factors particular to an individual case before making the determination. A contrary interpretation would render redundant any assessment of the frequency or manner in which the allegations were made and the presiding judge's reaction, factors which the appeal panel considered relevant to the overall inquiry. Second, it was open to the appeal panel to conclude that allegations of prosecutorial misconduct or other challenges to opposing counsel's integrity must both be made in good faith and have a reasonable basis. Various interveners take issue with this standard. The British Columbia Civil Liberties Association argues that sanctioning a lawyer for making good faith allegations without a reasonable basis punishes the lawyer for simply being mistaken. The CLAO agrees, submitting that the appeal panel standard does not give defense counsel the necessary latitude to fearlessly advance arguments that turn out to be incorrect. Accordingly, only allegations made in bad faith should warrant a finding of professional misconduct. I share the intervener's concerns that law societies should not sanction lawyers for sincerely held but mistaken legal positions or questionable litigation strategies. Nonetheless, in my view, the appeal panel standard withstands scrutiny. Allegations that impugn opposing counsel's integrity must not be made lightly. A reputation for integrity is a lawyer's most important professional asset. It generally takes a long time to build up and can be lost overnight. Courts and legal commentators have emphasized the importance of a lawyer's reputation. In Hill and Church of Scientology of Toronto, the court put it this way, quote, the reputation of a lawyer is of paramount importance to clients, to other members of the profession, and to the judiciary. A lawyer's practice is founded and maintained upon the basis of a good reputation for professional integrity and trustworthiness. It is the cornerstone of a lawyer's professional life. Even if endowed with outstanding talent and indefatigable diligence, 
a lawyer cannot survive without a good reputation, end quote. Maintaining a reputation for practicing with integrity is a lifelong challenge. Once sullied, a lawyer's reputation may never be fully restored. As such, allegations of prosecutorial misconduct must have a reasonable foundation. I agree with the appeal panel that anything less, quote, gives too much license to irresponsible counsel with sincere but nevertheless unsupportable suspicions, end quote. The consequences for the opposing lawyer's reputation are simply too severe to require anything less than a reasonable basis for allegations impugning his or her integrity. Finally, the appeal panel's reasonable basis requirement will not chill resolute advocacy. A lawyer must establish, quote, a proper evidentiary foundation, end quote, before alleging abuse of process arising from prosecutorial misconduct. Absent a proper foundation, an abuse of process motion will be summarily dismissed. Unreasonable allegations, therefore, do nothing to advance the client's case. An ethical standard prohibiting such allegations does not impair resolute advocacy. To be clear, not all defense action summarily dismissed under Cody will warrant professional sanction. On the contrary, defense action a court deems illegitimate may well fall short of professional misconduct. That said, the reasonable basis requirement is not an exacting standard. I understand the appeal panel to have meant that allegations made without a reasonable basis are those that are speculative or entirely lacking a factual foundation. Crucially, as the appeal panel noted, allegations do not lack a reasonable basis simply because they are based on legal error. In other words, it is not professional misconduct to challenge opposing counsel's integrity based on a sincerely held but incorrect legal position, so long as the challenge has a sufficient factual foundation, such that if the legal position were correct, the challenge would be warranted. Nor is it professional misconduct to advance a novel legal argument that is ultimately rejected by the court. Many legal principles we now consider foundational were once controversial ideas that were fearlessly raised by lawyers. Such innovative advocacy ought to be encouraged, not stymied by the threat of being labeled after the fact as unreasonable. In my view, there are two reasons why law societies cannot use a lawyer's legal errors to conclude that his or her allegations lack a reasonable basis. First, a finding of professional misconduct against a lawyer can itself be damaging to that lawyer's reputation. Branding a lawyer as uncivil for nothing more than advancing good faith allegations of impropriety that stem from a sincerely held legal mistake is a highly excessive and unwarranted response. Second, inquiring into the legal merit of a lawyer's position to conclude that his or her allegation lack a reasonable basis would discourage lawyers from raising well-founded allegations, impairing the lawyer's duty of resolute advocacy. Prosecutorial abuse of process is extraordinarily serious. It impairs trial fairness and compromises the integrity of the justice system. Defense lawyers play an integral role in preventing these dire consequences and holding other justice system participants accountable by raising reasonable allegations. Finding a lawyer guilty of professional misconduct on the basis of incivility for making an abuse of process argument that is based on a sincerely held but mistaken legal position discourages lawyers from raising these allegations, frustrating the duty of resolute advocacy and the client's right to make full answer and defense. My colleagues in dissent interpret the reasonable basis requirement differently. In their view, the appeal panel concluded that where allegations of impropriety made against opposing counsel stem from a mistake of law, the mistake must be both honest and reasonable. And if the appeal panel determines that the mistake of law is unreasonable, even though it is honestly held, then the allegations of impropriety will not be reasonably based and can therefore lead to a finding of professional misconduct on account of incivility. In so concluding, they contend that my interpretation of the reasonable basis requirement that allegations of impropriety must have a factual foundation and not be based on innuendo or speculation immunizes egregious legal errors from review, 
quote, effectively dispossessing the law societies of their regulatory authority any time a lawyer can cloak his accusations in a subjective legal belief, end quote. Respectfully, my colleagues' concerns are misplaced. When a lawyer alleges prosecutorial misconduct based on a legal mistake, law societies are perfectly entitled to look to the reasonableness of the mistake when assessing whether it is sincerely held and, hence, whether the allegations were made in good faith. Looking to the reasonableness of a mistake is a well-established tool to help assess its sincerity. The more egregious the legal mistake, the less likely it will have been sincerely held, making it less likely the allegation will have been made in good faith. And if the law society concludes that the allegation was not made in good faith, the second question, whether there was a reasonable basis for the allegation, falls away. I pause here to note that there is good reason why a law society can look to reasonableness of a legal mistake when assessing whether allegations of impropriety are made in good faith, but not when assessing whether they are reasonably based. The good faith inquiry asks what the lawyer actually believed when making the allegation. The reasonableness of the lawyer's legal mistake is one piece of circumstantial evidence that may help a law society in this exercise. However, it is not determinative. Even the most unreasonable mistakes can be sincerely held. In contrast, the reasonable basis inquiry requires the law society to look beyond what the lawyer believed and examine the foundation underpinning the allegations. Looking at the reasonableness of a lawyer's legal position at this stage would, in effect, impose a mandatory minimum standard of legal competence in the incivility context. In other words, it would allow a law society to find a lawyer guilty of professional misconduct on the basis of incivility for something the lawyer, in the law society's opinion, ought to have known or ought to have done. And, as I have already explained, This would risk unjustifiably tarnishing a lawyer's reputation and chilling resolute advocacy. That, however, does not end the matter. As my colleagues correctly observe, quote, the law society rules govern civility and competence, end quote. A lawyer who bases allegations on outrageous or egregious legal errors may be incompetent. My point is simply that he or she should not be punished for incivility on that basis alone. As such, any concern that law societies are effectively dispossessed of their regulatory authority misstates my position. To conclude, I would not give effect to Mr. Groya and the intervener's submissions criticizing how the appeal panel evaluated what the lawyer said. The appeal panel considered what the lawyer said to be an important contextual factor. Allegations of professional misconduct or other challenges to opposing counsel's integrity must be made in good faith and have a reasonable basis. Although a reasonable basis is not a high bar, I see no basis for interfering with the appeal panel's conclusion that it is necessary to protect against speculative or baseless allegations. 2. The manner and frequency of the lawyer's behavior. The appeal panel also considered the frequency of what was said and the manner in which it was said to be relevant factors. A single outburst would not usually attract sanction. In contrast, repetitive attacks on opposing counsel would be more likely to cross the line into professional misconduct. The appeal panel also found that challenges to opposing counsel's integrity made in a repetitive stream of invective or with sarcastic and biting tone were inappropriate. Finally, the appeal panel held that whether the lawyer was provoked was a relevant factor. Considering the manner and frequency of the lawyer's behavior was reasonable. Trials are often hard fought. The stakes are high, especially so in a criminal trial where the accused faces a loss of liberty. Emotions can sometimes get the better of even the most stoic litigators. Punishing a lawyer for a few ill-chosen, sarcastic, or even nasty comments ignores those realities. This does not mean that a solitary bout of incivility is beyond reproach. A single, scathing attack on the integrity of another justice system participant can and has warranted disciplinary action. Be that as it may, 
it is well within the appeal panel's purview to conclude that, as a general rule, repetitive personal attacks and those made using demeaning, sarcastic, or otherwise inappropriate language are more likely to warrant disciplinary action. One final point. When considering the manner and frequency of the lawyer's behavior, it must be remembered that challenges to another lawyer's integrity are, by their very nature, personal attacks. They often involve allegations that the lawyer has deliberately flouted his or her ethical or professional duties. Strong language that, in other contexts, might well be viewed as rude and insulting will regularly be necessary to bring forward allegations of prosecutorial misconduct or other challenges to the lawyer's integrity. Care must be taken not to conflate the strong language necessary to challenge another lawyer's integrity with the type of communication that warrant a professional misconduct finding. 3. The trial judge's reaction. The third factor the appeal panel identified is the presiding judge's reaction to the lawyer's behavior. I agree that when the impugned behavior occurs in a courtroom, what, if anything, the judge does about it becomes relevant. Unlike the law society, the presiding judge observes the lawyer's behavior firsthand. This offers the judge a comparatively advantageous position to evaluate the lawyer's conduct relative to the law society, who only enters the equation once all is said and done. As Appeal Justice Brown insightfully explained, quote, by its nature, a professional discipline proceeding is an exercise in retrospective examination of counsel's conduct by those who were not present when the conduct occurred and who lack the ability to recreate with precision and certainty exactly what took place. A discipline review is largely transcript-based, restricting the reviewer's ability to understand the sense and nuance of the moment. Retrospective transcript-based reviews contain inherent limitations which can produce an artificial understanding of what took place in the courtroom, and which risk turning the review into an exercise in Monday morning quarterbacking." End quote. These observations underscore the importance of considering the presiding judge's response to the lawyer's conduct. The question then becomes, how important is that response? Mr. Groya would treat the presiding judge's reaction as near conclusive. He argues that law societies should rarely, if ever, initiate disciplinary proceedings if the presiding judge took no issue with the lawyer's behavior. This is because allowing law societies to second-guess the presiding judge on the scope of acceptable courtroom conduct erodes judicial independence. In my view, Mr. Groya's restrictive approach is inappropriate for a number of reasons. First, unlike the presiding judge, law societies are not tasked with maintaining the fairness of any particular proceeding. The presiding judge has a responsibility to intervene when the fairness of the trial is at stake. This duty includes controlling uncivil behavior that risks undermining the fairness and the appearance of fairness of the proceeding. In contrast, by setting and enforcing standards of civility, law societies foster fairness and cultivate public confidence in the administration of justice on a profession-wide level. Preventing law societies from supervising courtroom behavior absent a trial judge's intervention frustrates these functions. Second, as the appeal panel recognized, quote, there may be many reasons why a trial judge may choose to remain relatively passive in the face of one or both counsel's courtroom incivility, end quote. For instance, as Justice Campbell pointed out, judicial intervention, quote, might simply excite further provocation, end quote, on the lawyer's part, thereby frustrating the goal of maintaining an orderly, fair proceeding. Judges may also be reasonably concerned about the appearance of impartiality, especially in a jury trial where reprimanding counsel in the jury's presence could conceivably prejudice that lawyer in the jury's eyes. In these situations, the trial judge's silence is not a tacit approval of the lawyer's behavior, but rather a conscious decision taken to protect trial fairness. Furthermore, in some cases, the trial judge's decision to remain passive may prove wrong and give rise to an unfair trial. It would be illogical to bar the law society from reviewing a lawyer's behavior based on a trial judge's error. Third, behavior that the presiding judge deems inappropriate may not rise to the level of professional misconduct. This court stressed in Cody 
that the courts will no longer tolerate illegitimate defense action, including baseless arguments and the way in which they are presented. However, as indicated, improper defense behavior is not necessarily professional misconduct, be it a function of incivility or incompetence. The law society must therefore be careful not to place too much weight on a judge's criticism of defense behavior. Fourth, as I explain above in paragraphs 54 to 55, the law society's decision to discipline a lawyer in no way impairs the presiding judge's ability to control his or her courtroom. Just as the law society's disciplinary decision is not conditional on the judge's response, the judge remains free to set boundaries of appropriate courtroom behavior irrespective of any law society standard of civility. It follows that the judge's reaction is not conclusive of the propriety of the lawyer's conduct. Rather, as the appeal panel concluded, it is simply one piece of the contextual analysis. Its weight will vary depending on the circumstances of the case. Part and parcel of the presiding judge's response is how the lawyer modified his or her behavior thereafter. The lawyer who crosses the line, but pays heed to the judge's direction, and behaves appropriately from then on, is less likely to have engaged in professional misconduct than the same lawyer who continues to behave inappropriately despite the judge's instructions. The appeal panel's approach allows for a proportionate balancing of lawyers' expressive rights and the law society's statutory mandate. An administrative decision that engages the charter by limiting its protections will only be reasonable if it reflects a proportionate balancing of the charter protections at play with the decision maker's statutory mandate. This court explained in Loyola that a proportionate balancing is one that gives effect as fully as possible to the charter protections at stake given the particular statutory mandate. Law society decisions that discipline lawyers for what they say may engage lawyers' expressive freedoms under Section 2B of the Charter. This is true regardless of whether the impugned speech occurs inside or outside a courtroom. Courtroom lawyers are engaged in expressive activity. The method and location of the speech do not remove the expressive activity from the scope of protected expression, and law society decisions sanctioning lawyers for what they say in the courtroom have the effect of restricting their expression. As such, a particular professional misconduct finding that engages a lawyer's expressive freedom will only be reasonable if it reflects a proportionate balancing of the law society's statutory objective with the lawyer's expressive freedom. Similarly, an approach to assessing whether a lawyer's uncivil communications warrant law society discipline must allow for such a proportionate balancing to occur. Under its statutory mandate, the law society has a duty to advance the public interest, the cause of justice, and the rule of law by regulating the legal profession. Disciplinary tribunals fulfill an integral subset of this function by setting and enforcing standards of professional conduct, in this case, civility. Performing this mandate can engage lawyers' expressive rights under the Charter. Allowing lawyers to freely express themselves serves an important function in our legal system. As Appeal Justice Steele noted in his stead, quote, the lawyer, as an intimate part of the legal system, plays a pivotal role in ensuring the accountability and transparency of the judiciary. To play that role effectively, he or she must feel free to act and speak without inhibition and with courage when the circumstances demand it, end quote. At issue in his stead was a disciplinary decision resulting from a lawyer's criticism of a judge. Appeal Justice Steele's comments were thus restricted to critical remarks directed at the judiciary. I would go further and add that lawyers play an integral role in holding all justice system participants accountable. Reasonable criticism enhances the transparency and fairness of the system as a whole, thereby serving the interests of justice. Overemphasizing civility has the potential to thwart this good by chilling well-founded criticism. Proportionality balancing lawyers' expressive rights, therefore, quote, may involve disciplinary bodies tolerating a degree of discordant criticism, 
end quote. When the impugned behavior occurs in a courtroom, lawyers' expressive freedom takes on additional significance. In that arena, the lawyer's primary function is to resolutely advocate on his or her client's behalf. As I discuss above at paragraphs 74 to 75, resolute advocacy in the criminal context allows the client to meaningfully exercise his or her constitutional right to make full answer and defense. Law society tribunals must account for this unique aspect of lawyers' expressive rights when arriving at a disciplinary decision arising out of in-court behavior. That said, speech is not sacrosanct simply because it is uttered by a lawyer. Certain communications will be far removed from the core values Section 2B seeks to protect, the search for truth and the common good. The protection afforded to expressive freedom diminishes the further the speech lies from the core values of Section 2B. As such, a finding of professional misconduct is more likely to represent a proportionate balance of the law society's statutory objective with the lawyer's expressive rights wherein the impugned speech lies far from the core values of a lawyer's expressive freedom. The flexibility built into the appeal panel's context-specific approach to assessing a lawyer's behavior allows for a proportionate balancing in any given case. Considering the unique circumstances in each case, such as what the lawyer said, the context in which he or she said it, and the reason it was said, enables law society disciplinary tribunals to accurately gauge the value of the impugned speech. This, in turn, allows for a decision, both with respect to a finding of professional misconduct and any penalty imposed, that reflects a proportionate balancing of the lawyer's expressive rights and the law society's statutory mandate. In addition, the appeal panel's reasonable basis standard allows for a proportionate balancing between expressive freedom and the law society's statutory mandate. Allegations impugning opposing counsel's integrity that lack a reasonable basis lie far from the core values underpinning lawyers' expressive rights. Reasonable criticism advances the interests of justice by holding other players accountable. Unreasonable attacks do quite the opposite. As I have explained at paragraph 63 to 67, such attacks frustrate the interests of justice by undermining trial fairness and public confidence in the justice system. A decision finding a lawyer guilty of professional misconduct for launching unreasonable allegations would therefore be likely to represent a proportionate balancing of the law society's mandate and the lawyer's expressive rights. In contrast, sanctioning a lawyer for good faith, reasonably based allegations that are grounded in legal error does not reflect a proportionate balancing. Advancing good faith, reasonable allegations, even those based on legal error, helps maintain the integrity of the justice system by holding other participants accountable. Well-founded arguments exposing misconduct on the part of opposing counsel thus lie close to the core of the 2B values underpinning a lawyer's expressive freedom. Discouraging lawyers from bringing forward such allegations does nothing to further the law society's statutory mandate of advancing the cause of justice and the rule of law. If anything, silencing lawyers in this manner undercuts the rule of law and the cause of justice by making it more likely that misconduct will go unchecked. Conclusion. In sum, I would not give effect to Mr. Groya's and the intervener's challenges to the appeal panel's approach to incivility, and in particular, when a lawyer's courtroom conduct warrants a finding of professional misconduct. The appeal panel appreciated the need to guard against the consequences of incivility and remain sensitive to the lawyer's duty of resolute advocacy. Its contextual analysis accommodates the diversity of modern legal practice. At the same time, the appeal panel articulated a series of factors, what the lawyer said, the manner and frequency in which it was said, and the presiding judge's reaction to the lawyer's behavior, and explained how those factors operate in a way that is sufficiently precise to guide lawyers' conduct and instruct disciplinary tribunals in future cases. Finally, the appeal panel's approach allows for a proportionate balancing of lawyers' expressive rights and law society's statutory mandate. 2. Application to Mr. Groya's case. 
While I take no issue with the appeal panel's approach, I am respectfully of the view that the appeal panel unreasonably found Mr. Groya guilty of professional misconduct. In assessing what Mr. Groya said, the appeal panel reiterated that misconduct allegations or other challenges to opposing counsel's integrity cross the line into professional misconduct unless they are made in good faith and have a reasonable basis. The appeal panel accepted that Mr. Groya's allegations of misconduct were made in good faith. It based its finding of professional misconduct primarily on the fact that his allegations lacked a reasonable basis. However, contrary to its own approach, the appeal panel used Mr. Groya's sincerely held but erroneous legal beliefs to reach this conclusion. One which, as I have explained above in paragraphs 88 to 91, cannot be reasonable. Once the allegations of impropriety, what Mr. Groya said, are no longer in the mix, it becomes apparent that the other factors in this case cannot reasonably support a finding of professional misconduct against him. As I will explain, the frequency of Mr. Groya's allegations was, to some extent, a product of the uncertainty surrounding the manner in which abusive process allegations should be raised, a factor the appeal panel did not consider. Moreover, the trial judge took a largely hands-off approach and did not direct Mr. Groya as to how he should be bringing his allegations. Eventually, the trial judge did intervene, albeit quite late in the day, and he instructed Mr. Groya not to keep repeating the same allegations over and over again, but to simply register his objection. In response, Mr. Groya complied, albeit with the odd slip. And when the reviewing courts admonished Mr. Groya for his behavior during phase one of the Feldehoff trial, phase two proceeded entirely without incident. Again, the appeal panel did not factor the trial judge and reviewing court's response to Mr. Groya's behavior and how Mr. Groya modified his conduct thereafter into its analysis. Taking these factors into account, I am respectfully of the view that there is only one reasonable outcome in this manner a finding that Mr. Groya did not engage in professional misconduct on account of incivility. The appeal panel used Mr. Groya's mistaken legal beliefs to conclude that his allegations lacked a reasonable basis. The appeal panel acknowledged that the submissions made on the basis of a sincerely held but erroneous legal belief cannot ground a finding of professional misconduct. It accepted that in making his allegations of impropriety against the OSC prosecutors, quote, Mr. Groya was not deliberately misrepresenting the law and was not ill-motivated, end quote. That said, the appeal panel used Mr. Groya's legal errors to conclude that he had no reasonable basis for his repeated allegations of prosecutorial impropriety. With respect, such a finding was not reasonably open to the appeal panel. Mr. Groya's legal errors, coupled with the OSC prosecutor's conduct, provided a reasonable basis for his allegations. Had Mr. Groya been right in law, his abuse allegations against the OSC prosecutors would almost certainly have been substantiated. Recall that the allegations arose during disputes about disclosure and the admissibility of documentary evidence. Mr. Groya argued that the prosecutors were using a conviction filter to deliberately undermine the fairness of Mr. Feldehoff's trial by failing to tender, as part of the OSC's case, any relevant, authentic document of Mr. Groya's choosing. He launched further allegations of impropriety when the prosecutors objected to his attempts to introduce documents through a witness that had neither seen them nor authored them. His beliefs in this regard were fueled in part by comments made by Mr. Naster during the first disclosure motion brought by Mr. Groya early on in the Felderhof proceedings. They were also supported, in part, by the trial judge's rulings against the OSC on disclosure issues and his rejection of the OSC's request for an omnibus ruling on the admissibility of all documents. During the first disclosure motion brought by Mr. Groya, Mr. Naster submitted to the court that he had, quote, an obligation as a prosecutor to ensure that all relevant materials are placed before the trial judge, end quote, and that he was duty-bound to place relevant materials before the court. While Mr. Naster was referring to his disclosure obligations, his statements lent credence to Mr. Groya's sincerely held but mistaken belief 
that the prosecution was legally required to introduce all relevant documents through its own witnesses and that the OSC was acting improperly in refusing to do so. In its reasons, the appeal panel was careful to point out that it was not concluding that Mr. Groy's allegations lacked a reasonable basis because of his sincerely held but mistaken legal belief. They stated, quote, Our concern about the submissions quoted above is not merely that Mr. Groy was making incorrect legal submissions. That, of course, is not a basis for a finding of professional misconduct, end quote. The Law Society confirmed its position in the oral hearing before this court, acknowledging that, quote, it is not professional misconduct to make an erroneous submission as to the law, end quote. However, it did precisely what it professed it should not do. Specifically, it repeatedly used Mr. Groya's sincerely held but mistaken legal beliefs to ground its conclusion that Mr. Groya's allegation lacked a reasonable foundation. The appeal panel concluded that Mr. Groya's allegations lacked a reasonable basis because the OSC prosecutors were right in law. Put another way, the appeal panel concluded that Mr. Groya's allegations lacked a reasonable basis because he was wrong in law. That was unreasonable. As I have explained, allegations of prosecutorial misconduct based on a sincerely held but mistaken legal belief will be reasonably based as long as they have a sufficient factual foundation. The question for incivility purposes is not whether Mr. Groy was right or wrong in the law. Rather, the question is whether, based on his understanding of the law, his allegations of prosecutorial misconduct, which the appeal panel found were made in good faith, had a factual foundation. In this case, they did. As indicated, had Mr. Groya's views on the role of the prosecutor and the law of evidence been correct, he would have been justified in his alleging abuse of process. His submissions regarding professional misconduct would not only have had a reasonable basis, they may well have had been accepted. The prosecution repeatedly and intentionally failed to tender all relevant documents despite Mr. Groya's repeated requests. It also objected to Mr. Groya's presenting any relevant document of his choosing to a Crown witness. Viewed this way, it is apparent that Mr. Groya's allegations, based as they were on his sincerely held but mistaken legal beliefs, had ample factual foundation. I appreciate that the appeal panel also found that Mr. Groya's allegations had no factual foundation because, contrary to Mr. Groya's understanding, quote, the prosecutors had not promised that they would introduce all relevant documents regardless of the rules of evidence, end quote. This contributed to the appeal panel's finding that Mr. Groy's allegations lacked a reasonable basis. Respectfully, however, that conclusion was not reasonably open to the appeal panel. Mr. Groya's understanding of what the OSC prosecutors said must be assessed in light of his sincerely held but mistaken legal beliefs. This is because failing to appreciate how Mr. Groya's legal mistakes colored his understanding of the facts effectively allowed the appeal panel to use those legal mistakes to find that his allegations lacked a reasonable basis, contrary to its own approach. As discussed, Mr. Groya mistakenly believed that the prosecution was legally required to introduce all relevant documents through its own witnesses. It is therefore understandable that he would interpret Mr. Nasser's submission that he was duty-bound to place all relevant documents before the court as a promise to tender those documents. This is especially so given the trial judge's failure to correct Mr. Groya's mistaken legal positions, a point I discuss in greater detail below. It was unreasonable to conclude that Mr. Groya's assertions that the OSC was reneging on its promises lacked factual foundation. They were based on an ambiguous statement that Mr. Goya reasonably interpreted as a promise because of his erroneous understanding of the law of evidence. In this regard, it is important to note that the appeal panel would normally be in a position to consider the reasonableness of the lawyer's legal beliefs. In this case, Mr. Goya's erroneous understanding of the role of the prosecutor and the law of evidence, and conclude that they were not sincerely held. However, that finding was not open to the appeal panel here. In view of the fact that it did not hear Mr. Groya testify, the appeal panel assumed that his legal mistakes were sincerely held and therefore that his allegations of prosecutorial misconduct were made in good faith. In short, 
Mr. Groya's legal errors, coupled with how the OSC prosecutors conducted themselves, provided the reasonable basis for his allegations. Based on its own findings, including that Mr. Groya's allegations were made in good faith, it was not reasonably open to the appeal panel to conclude that Mr. Groya was guilty of professional misconduct on account of incivility. On its own approach, his allegations were made in good faith and reasonably held. My colleagues in dissent accept that the appeal panel, quote, considered the legal underpinnings of Mr. Groya's claims to be whether they had a reasonable basis. My colleagues in dissent accept that the appeal panel, quote, considered the legal underpinnings of Mr. Groya's claims to determine whether they had a reasonable basis, end quote. In their view, it was open to the appeal panel to do so. Respectfully, I cannot agree. Allowing the appeal panel to consider the legal underpinnings of a lawyer's allegations would allow it to find a lawyer guilty of professional misconduct for nothing more than making a good faith allegation of impropriety that stems from a sincerely held legal mistake. As I have explained, at paragraphs 88 to 91, such a finding is unreasonable. It does not account for Mr. Groya's duty of resolute advocacy a duty of particular importance in this case given its impact on his client's right to make full answer and defense. Mr. Groya was both entitled and bound to protect his client's rights by raising a reasonably based, good faith arguments about the propriety of the OSC's conduct, even though those arguments turned out to be legally incorrect. Nor does such a finding reflect a proportionate balancing of the lawyer's expressive rights and the law society's statutory objective of advancing the cause of justice and the rule of law by setting and enforcing standards of civility. In the end, what Mr. Groya said, his allegations impugning the OSC prosecutor's integrity, should not have been used to ground a finding of professional misconduct against him. The appeal panel unreasonably concluded otherwise. The other contextual factors cannot reasonably support a finding of professional misconduct. The other contextual factors in this case cannot reasonably ground a finding of professional misconduct against Mr. Groya. The frequency of Mr. Groya's allegations, the presiding judge's response, and how Mr. Groya modified his behavior in response to the directions of the presiding judge and the reviewing courts all suggest that Mr. Groya's behavior during phase one of the Feldhoff trial was not worthy of professional sanction. The manner in which Mr. Groya raised his allegations was inappropriate, but that cannot, in the circumstances of this case, reasonably support a finding of professional misconduct. When phase one of the Feldhoff trial took place, uncertainty surrounded how allegations of abuse of process should be brought forward. Specifically, Prior to Appeal Justice Rosenberg's decision dismissing the OSC's appeal of its judicial review application, it was not at all clear that defense counsel who wished to raise abuse of process should refrain from repeating their allegations throughout the trial, but wait instead until the end of trial to bring a motion. Given this procedural uncertainty, uncertainty that the appeal panel did not account for, the frequency of Mr. Groya's allegations was understandable. This court instructed that an abuse of process motion should typically be brought at the end of trial. The court reasoned that deciding the abuse motion at the end of the proceeding gives the trial judge a full evidentiary record to assess the prejudice caused by the abuse of conduct and tailor the appropriate remedy. What remained unclear was the manner in which counsel was entitled to raise abuse of process arguments. Could these allegations be made repeatedly throughout the trial? or must a lawyer hold off in raising them until the end of the trial during an abuse of process motion? Mr. Groya opted for the former by repeatedly accusing the prosecutors of the same deliberate wrongdoing. Mr. Groya was laying the evidentiary groundwork for an abuse of process motion he intended to bring at the end of trial. He was also putting the OSC on notice of his intention to bring the motion. This approach was improper. To be sure, prosecutors are entitled to notice that the defense believes their conduct is improper and will be bringing an abuse of process motion at the end of the proceeding. But defense counsel is not entitled to repeatedly make the same allegations of deliberate wrongdoing outside of that motion. Accordingly, the trial judge did not have to listen to the same allegations made over and over again by Mr. Groya. Indeed, he should have acted sooner to curb them.
But hindsight is 2020. The frequency of Mr. Groya's abuse allegations must be evaluated based on the state of the law when he made them. The appeal panel failed to account for the uncertainty surrounding the proper approach to raising abuse of process arguments. Uncertainty that was only clarified by Appeal Justice Rosenberg in his reasons dismissing the OSC's appeal of its judicial review application. I appreciate that the way in which the evolving law of abuse of process influenced Mr. Groya's allegations was not argued before the appeal panel. Nevertheless, in my respectful view, it was unreasonable for the appeal panel to evaluate Mr. Groya's behavior based on the law of abuse of process Appeal Justice Rosenberg articulated in Feldhoff three years after the conduct took place. The appeal panel also failed to factor into its analysis how the trial judge reacted to Mr. Groya's behavior and how Mr. Groya modified his conduct in response to the trial judge and reviewing court's directions. Both of these factors suggest that Mr. Groya's behavior was not worthy of a finding of professional misconduct. Mr. Groya began accusing the OSC prosecutors of impropriety early on in the proceedings. Yet, for the vast majority of Phase 1, the trial judge adopted a passive stance, choosing not to comment on the substance of Mr. Groya's allegations or the manner in which he was making them. The trial judge remained largely silent, even as the OSC prosecutors repeatedly complained about Mr. Groya's behavior, and instead that the trial judge rule on whether their conduct was improper. For example, after one hotly contested exchange between the parties, the trial judge accepted that Mr. Groya's allegations were, quote, notice that an abuse of process application may come at the end of the day, and stated that there is no ruling to be made with respect to the matter, end quote. The trial judge responded to another of the OSC's requests to rule on Mr. Groya's allegations by stating that he expected both counsel, quote, to conduct themselves professionally, end quote. It was not until the 57th day of trial that the judge first instructed Mr. Groya to simply make the same objection when he believed the prosecutors were acting inappropriately. On the record before this court, the trial judge reminded Mr. Groya to refrain from repeating his misconduct allegations on two more occasions in the remaining weeks of phase one. In response, Mr. Groya largely complied with the trial judge's admonition. The appeal panel noted the relevance of the presiding judge's reaction to the professional misconduct inquiry. However, it did not once mention how the trial judge reacted to Mr. Goya's allegations when assessing his behavior. This was a significant omission. While I accept that the trial judge's passive approach throughout the bulk of Mr. Goya's prosecutorial misconduct allegations does not, on its own, absolve Mr. Goya of any wrongdoing, it nevertheless shaped both the substance and the manner of Mr. Groya's allegations. First, by failing to correct Mr. Groya's legal mistakes, the trial judge buttressed the reasonableness of Mr. Groya's sincerely held but mistaken belief that the OSC prosecutors were in fact acting abusively. Second, the trial judge's failure to admonish Mr. Groya for the manner in which he raised his allegations signaled to Mr. Groya that there was nothing wrong with the way he was impugning the prosecution's integrity. It was therefore imperative for the appeal panel to consider the trial judge's reaction when evaluating Mr. Groya's conduct. In this regard, I note that this was a judge-alone trial, and admonishing Mr. Groya for the manner in which he was impugning the prosecutor's integrity could not possibly have prejudiced him the way it might have had this been a jury trial. Equally, There was nothing preventing the trial judge from admonishing Mr. Groya for his mistaken legal beliefs and letting him know that they did not form a proper basis for allegations of prosecutorial misconduct. Nor did the appeal panel incorporate Mr. Groya's marked change in behavior in response to the directions of the trial judge and the reviewing court into its analysis. When the trial judge instructed Mr. Groya how to object when he thought the prosecution was offside, Mr. Groya, for the most part, listened. And after receiving a public shaming from Justice Campbell and Appeal Justice Rosenberg, phase two of the Feldhoff trial unfolded without incident. It was incumbent on the appeal panel to factor in Mr. Groya's compliance with the judge's directions when assessing his behavior. Both the trial judge's passivity and Mr. Groya's compliance with the directions given by every judge involved in this case militate against a finding of professional misconduct.
The final contextual factor is the manner in which Mr. Groya brought his allegations. My colleagues assert that I discount the manner in which Mr. Groya made his allegations, thereby setting a benchmark for professional misconduct that permits sustained and sarcastic personal attacks. Respectfully, I take issue with that characterization of my reasons. I appreciate that a lawyer can be found guilty of professional misconduct for challenging opposing counsel's integrity in an appropriate manner. However, in this case, the manner in which Mr. Groya made his allegations could not on its own reasonably ground a finding of professional misconduct. To be sure, Mr. Groya should not have made his allegations in the sarcastic tone that he sometimes employed. The tenor of his allegations at times descended into what can be fairly described as petulant invective. However, as indicated, throughout the majority of phase one, the trial judge did not criticize Mr. Groya for the manner in which he was making his allegations. Although the trial judge's passivity cannot be taken as acquiescence, it is nonetheless a relevant contextual factor to consider when evaluating the language and tone Mr. Groya chose to employ. When the trial judge did intervene, Mr. Groya appropriately modified the way in which he pursued his abuse of process arguments. The sarcastic manner in which Mr. Groya challenged the prosecutor's integrity simply cannot, in light of the other contextual factors in this case, justify the appeal panel's finding of professional misconduct. My colleagues in dissent rely heavily on Justice Campbell and Appeal Justice Rosenberg's critical comments of Mr. Groya's behavior throughout Phase 1 to reach a contrary conclusion. Those comments, however, were made in a proceeding to which Mr. Groya was not a party without giving Mr. Groya an opportunity to defend himself. While undoubtedly helpful in guiding Mr. Groya on the scope of appropriate behavior going forward, it is unfair to take those comments as conclusive proof of professional misconduct on account of incivility. Further, as indicated, despite the criticisms leveled at Mr. Groya by Justice Campbell and Appeal Justice Rosenberg for the uncivil way in which he had made his allegations against Mr. Nastor, the trial judge never once castigated Mr. Groya for the tone or manner of his submissions or the language used by him. Part 5. Conclusion and Disposition The appeal panel's finding of professional misconduct against Mr. Groya was unreasonable. The appeal panel used Mr. Groya's sincerely held but mistaken legal beliefs to conclude that his allegations of prosecutorial misconduct lacked a reasonable basis. But, as I have explained, Mr. Groya's legal errors, in conjunction with the OSC prosecutor's conduct, formed the reasonable basis upon which his allegations rested. In these circumstances, it was not open to the appeal panel to conclude that Mr. Groya's allegations lacked a reasonable basis. And because the appeal panel accepted that the allegations were made in good faith, it was not reasonably open for it to find Mr. Groya guilty of professional misconduct based on what he said. The appeal panel also failed to account for the evolving abuse of process law, the trial judge's reaction to Mr. Groya's behavior, and Mr. Groya's response. All factors which suggest Mr. Groya's behavior was not worthy of professional discipline on account of incivility. The finding of professional misconduct against him was therefore unreasonable. Looking at the circumstances of this case as a whole, the following becomes apparent. Mr. Groya's mistaken allegations were made in good faith and were reasonably based. The manner in which he raised them was improper. However, the very nature of Mr. Groya's allegations, deliberate prosecutorial misconduct depriving his client of a fair trial, led him to use strong language that may well have been inappropriate in other contexts. The frequency of his allegations was influenced by the underdeveloped abuse of process jurisprudence. The trial judge chose not to curb Mr. Groya's allegations throughout the majority of phase one. When the trial judge and reviewing courts did give instructions, Mr. Groya appropriately modified his behavior. Taking these considerations into account, the only reasonable disposition is a finding that he did not engage in professional misconduct. I would allow the appeal and set aside the decision of the appeal panel with respect to the finding of professional misconduct against Mr. Groya and the penalty imposed. I would award costs to Mr. Groya in this court and in the courts below, as well as in the proceedings before the Law Society, 
because Mr. Groya, in the circumstances of this case, could not reasonably be found guilty of professional misconduct, the complaints against him are dismissed, and there is no need to remit the matter back to the Law Society. Thanks for the listen, friend. I hope you're able to enjoy that case and learn something new from it. Legal Listening is founded by Zach Battiston and Carly Lyons. It is hosted by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and you, our listeners. Executive produced by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and Anthony Rademeyer. Audio engineering by Anthony Rademeyer. Graphic design by Julie Lundy. Check her out online at julielundyart.com. And music done by Matt Rademeyer at radandkel.com. At Legal Listening, we're always open to new ideas, suggestions, and of course, guest readers. Check us out on Twitter at Legal Listening or online at LegalListening.com. Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We'll catch you in the next case. Bye now.